welcome to Notes from the Underground with your host, Deborah Jane East, and commentaries by myself, Derek Tyler. Nothing is really as it seems these days. In order to get to the bottom line, you have to go underground, where men and women search for answers, risking their lives to bring you the truth. Good evening, everyone. This is Deborah Jane East from Notes from the Underground. Uh, I would like to have a beautiful day here in Washington. It's been a sunny day after a couple of days of rain, and I've been busy working on different projects, and I was quite pleased a few days ago when I was contacted by someone about being on my show. And I first learned about him last year when he experienced a, a family tragedy, and I became uh, aware of his situation, and I started reading up on uh, all of his um, information from, you know, various radio shows, and that's how I learned about Steve Pierce. Now, some of you may not recognize his name, but he is a part of one of the largest UFO documented stories that out there, and if you watch movies, you probably watch Fire in the Sky uh, with Travis Walton. But today's show is not about Travis or even any of the other people that were witness to this uh, horrific event back in 1975 in Snowflake, uh, Arizona. What this is about is the ways that abductions change people and what they experience afterwards. And when I spoke to Steve, Earlier, just from hearing his voice, I can tell that there are so many things about what happened to him that he has issues with. So he's here tonight to tell his story. And first of all, I want to thank you for contacting me, Steve. How are you doing? Pretty good. Thank you for having me. You are more than welcome. So after this event in 1975, one of the things that I noticed about you is you sort of were out of the limelight all the things going on with Travis Walton and the others, and you've never really sought out to get attention other than do a few shows and conferences uh, in 2012. What has made you decide to start doing interviews again? I've already done a couple in the last five years. Usually it's with, with, with a friend of mine named David. For some reason I, I wanted to do one with you. I don't know why. Well, you know, you have to trust your instincts. And I know that your daughter played a big part in uh, you even having anything to do with it in the first place. Uh, tell me a little bit about her. Is she still interested in the UFOs and things? Yeah, she's a, yeah, she believes she's into it. Um, I uh, broke my neck, and well, they made the movie Fire in the Sky in '91 or '92 or something like that. I was in a truck stop, Waterstone, California, and it was like two o'clock in the morning, and and uh, I went to pay for the fuel, and I went to the restroom, and on the way out, I went to the TV room to see if anybody was going to drive for the rest of the night. And there was Travis Walton on, on the uh, HBO talking about the movie Fire in the Sky, and that's how I knew they made a movie. Well, uh, 2007, 2008, I, uh, I, maybe, I can't exactly, about, about 10 years ago, I guess. Well, anyway, I, I, I fell off a load to... Three, four, five, six, seven vertebrae was pushed against the spinal cord, and it was just about to snap the spinal cord, and um, I would have been paralyzed from the neck down. So they did surgery on my neck. My neck's all folded together, and they cut the front, and then they put a plate, and cut the back, and they put a plate, and they separated it from the spinal cord. Well, when I was home recuperating, um, um, I was telling my daughter was got the movie Fire in the Sky, and I never watched it. I never saw it. Um, I was telling my daughter, uh, Henry Thomas, he, was, he plays my part in the movie. They changed his name. I'm the kid in the movie. Henry Thomas is a little boy that plays E.T. Um, oh, yeah, he's one of my favorite actors, by the way. I really enjoyed his part. Well, anyway, I got about five minutes and six, maybe, maybe 15 minutes into it, and I got mad, uh, walked away, and I didn't see it, I didn't see it again for, for years. Um, and then when I came out of the closet, um, a friend of mine named, named David Sinet, he, uh, lives in New Jersey, um, he, he's on your Facebook. Um, he wanted me to do a conference with him, and so he finally talks to me into it, and 
Well, people were asking me about the movie, and, you know, I couldn't answer the questions. So finally, after 20 years, I, I, I finally watched the movie all the way through, and the movie is totally wrong. Um, what was the biggest I, problem you had with the movie? The movie itself. <laughs> the whole thing, huh? <laughs> uh, well, we were we were out in the woods. <laughs> they got that part right, huh? <laughs> I mean, Travis did get zapped by a UFO, but Travis did not run up there and do the jig underneath the UFO. Uh-huh. When he got when he got out, he didn't even. He says he ran up there. Uh, he didn't run. I sit there and watch the whole thing. This is why we don't get along. We, we do not get along. I tried to do a conference with him last week after five years. I did a conference with him in Utah. And we're supposed to do another one this weekend in Salt Lake, but I don't think I'm going to do it. I don't want to be around him anymore. Um, I am going to do a conference by myself in Nevada at the end of the month, but I'm going to do that by myself. And once that's done, I, I, I am not going to get back up there and talk about it anymore. Um, this is old, you know. Right. Okay. In the book, it says, Travis wrote the book. Travis has never asked me one thing about the book, okay, about my side of the story. He's never asked me anything. Well, he wrote in the book that, that I was crying. That's wrong. It's not true. We did a conference about five or six years ago with me, Travis, and John Gillette. John Gillette's a good buddy of mine. He was there too. And, uh, uh, and, and I told, uh, John, I said, tell him the truth what happened. He said, yeah, it's not what happened. You know, in the book, you know. And then I was telling Travis that, that when we was taking the polygraph test, that, that, um, um, they picked me first because, you know, they, they came after me because I was the youngest. They thought I would crack. And Travis says, no, y'all do straw. I don't know where you got that from. That's not true. But anyway, after uh, uh, Paranormal Witness did that show on us, that's the most true, that's the most, that's 99% right. We watched Paranormal Witness on the Sci-Fi Channel in Season 2, Episode 9. That is the best one ever made. Okay. I did. I listened to it, and I agree. It it sounded very factual to me. And none of us, none of us were together. None of, none of us saw each other when we did this. Everybody was separate. I did my interview in California, in, in Hollywood. They sent me out. They, people were really nice people. Well, anyway, that's the most true. And 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 if you watch this. And he, the, the guy that's taking the polygraph test, he's in there, I can't think of the name, but anyway, he's in there, he even said that the reason they picked me because I was the youngest and they thought I would crack. So they came after me deliberately, thinking that, well, well, make him go first, he'll crack and we don't have to, uh, uh worry about him the rest of the polygraph test because he, he would tell us what happened, you know, because you know, they thought we killed Travis five days we thought we killed Travis. Right. And so I was telling that to Travis before uh before uh, uh paranormal witness and he was telling me, No, oh, y'all do straw. Well he's he's done that and then um and me crying crying, I why would I cry over Travis, you know? I I wouldn't cry over Travis. I mean we were upset. The only one that really was upset that upset with Mike Rogers, he felt he was me, you know. And John even told Travis that what you wrote in the book isn't true, you know. And Travis said, well, what, do you want me, what, what do you want me to do now? Change the whole book, you know. And and then, uh, there's a few other things. I, I I just don't want to have anything to do with it anymore. I mean, it's, it's all about him, and it's not about us. Um, there's a woman, uh, they have a new one out now called Travis. I'm in that one too. Um, it's it's not a movie; it's a biography. You know, they do it. We're just talking in it. And the woman who who uh, uh, her name is Jennifer Stein. She's the woman who 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 got the movie going and everything. Well, I met her in Heber, Arizona, with David Sinet, and um, and she told me uh, there was only going to show this one time, you know. 
and, and that was going to be at the 40th anniversary. They were doing a, a conference in, over by Heber, Arizona on the 40th anniversary, and they were only going to show it one time. Well, now the Sheldon's driving goes, well, you must, you know, he didn't believe me. I said, I said, she told me he was only going to show this one time. Why would I sign a piece of paper saying, yeah, you can use my name for free, you know, and you can sell this stuff, you know, why would I do that? It doesn't make any sense. Travis says, well, it doesn't. It's, it's not it's really Travis, not Travis, Travis, well, Yeah, Travis says, well, well, uh, you know, she told you we were going to sell this. I, she didn't tell me that. She told me that it was going to show one time and it was going to be for free at the, uh, at the time. Well, you must have misunderstood her. I did not misunderstood her. You know. Now the selling, that's the reason I don't want to write a book. I told people, I, I have two exes that wrote a book about me. One actually for sale. Um, I, well, one's an ex, one's, one's an ex-girlfriend, one's an ex-wife. The ex-wife, she, she made her book, but she never published. She just made enough for, uh, for her kids and everybody. You know, my kids, our kids, our grandkids, we have something. So she will not publish it. But the other one, uh, it's my daughter's uh, mother, we want to marry. Uh, she's got a book out and she published it. And um, they both even told me, check this out. They, both, they says, well, if you write a book, you better be careful because people might be able to sue you. And they're going to sue wow. me about, about me. They've already wrote the book, you know. <laughs> that cracked me up. That's interesting. That is interesting. Uh, you know how exes are. You know they want everything they can get from you. <laughs> this is just really wild. I'm so glad to get this other story because I can see that the public has been deceived about a lot of the facts. Yeah. Um. And you don't strike me as anybody that would cry. I mean, you you are very blunt I, with the right. I've cried three times in my life. My dad died, and my brother died, and when my wife died, and I still cry over that. And I'm, no, I don't cry. Um, uh, yeah, I never, I did not believe that because number one, this wasn't even looking at you. You know, he would be going on somebody else's word, and he didn't see it for himself. So I don't really see why he should. You know, yeah, why, why, I mean, he, he didn't even ask you. He didn't. He's never asked me one thing. About about what happened that night. Never, never. Then he, without then you he, guys, he wouldn't have a story. <laughs> well, without us, you yeah. He, without us, he would, he would be the, uh, just the crazy person on the street, you know. And he got well. He's got what he wants now. He's got us all on the video saying that you know we saw this. But Travis did not run up. Okay, he got out of the truck and was walking to the right of the UFO. He did not go straight up to it. He walked into an angle. And then Alan Dallas, he hit the floorboard. He's the tough guy in the movie. Uh-huh. Actually, he, was, he wasn't all, all that tough. Actually, none of them. The only tough ones are me and John Gillette. But anyway, uh, uh, Travis walked sideways up there. And he got about 20 feet from it. And he stopped. And this thing started rocking back and forth. And... Uh, this blue green, green light came out and, and, and zapped it. And then, uh, it was beautiful. This thing was just hovering in the air. Yeah. How big was it? Uh, 50 feet or something like that. That's pretty it was, big. It was like, it was like two cake pans on top of each other. That's how it was shaped. But it was uh-huh. solid white. In the movie, Fire in the Sky, they made it look like a fire. Like a lava looking out on the and, and they said, well, it looks like a fire. No one ever said it looked like a fire. It was solid white. I, you know, the thing was solid white. And, and you could see window frames coming down like, you know, uh, I don't know if this is, they weren't actually, I think they were just part of the ship and put the ship together, you know what I mean? But they looked like uh-huh. window frames. And uh, you couldn't see inside of it. And then when Travis got back, I said they got him, and uh, Mike took off. Well, in the movie, it shows that Mike goes back by himself. Mike would have never went by himself. And you couldn't have left us out there in the woods by ourselves. Everybody stuck with that truck wherever that pickup went. He 
win. So we saw the UFO take off. We saw it take off into the sky. So we all got our courage back. And we knew it was gone. And we we're, we're, before that we started, we were trying to decide should we go to town, get help, go get some guns, you know, uh, call the cop. Uh, me and Alan Dallas, we're, we were gifted all the time. So we're, we were the outlaws in the community. And we were, we were lived in a Mormon community. Uh, Snowflake named after, uh, the snows and the flakes that came up from Utah were, went down, went down in that club. And, uh, they settled the town and, and the, the cops who ran it, it's different now, the cops who ran it back in the 70s were flakes. And, uh, he's the one that, uh, that pulled me over and told me that, I think it was like the third, fourth day that Travis was gone, and he told me, he says, uh, he says, you might as well tell us the truth, because if, if this goes to trial, and you were with these guys, you were just as guilty as the person who did the murder. We don't believe you did the murder. We just believe that you're covering it up and we can't figure out why you're covering this up. And I told him, he said, it was a truth. He said, well, you might as well confess before you take that polygraph test. Once you take that polygraph test, it's going to be too late. And so he went on his way and, and then uh, we went took that polygraph test and I was the first one. That's right in the movie. It shows that Henry Thomas takes the, uh, the polygraph test first. I did take it first. Um, they, uh, they were all talking about how I wasn't saying a word. I didn't say much for a couple of weeks. Even the night it happened, you know, it shows in the movie that everybody's hollering and screaming. I, I wasn't hollering. I wasn't screaming. I was sitting there just looking at this thing like, wow, man, what is this, you know? It's and, kind of like a shock. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, 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 I'll track there. <laughs> You got any questions? Well, yeah, I sure do. After you see something like that, there's a lot of changes that go on physically. Tell me afterwards, um, did you sleep well or did you have problems sleeping? Did it make you nervous or jittery? How did it, how did it affect your body? Um, I, I couldn't even sleep very well for a long time. The, the hard part is that, um, the first five days, everybody thought we were murdered. After that, um, uh, it turned out to be a big joke. Everybody thought we were lying. We couldn't get a job, you know. And, and then, uh, I got married and I, I moved to Taylor. Taylor is the next town over. We lived, we lived in a trailer on a dirt road and you could see the traffic coming down the road to cover. Well, uh, my wife at the time, she goes, she goes, the cops are coming down the road. What'd you do this time? So Jim Quick pulls up up in the, in, in the uh, driveway, comes up to the door, and, and tells me that Philip Black that he'd give you so much of money if you said this was a hoax. Well, I just blew it off at the time. I didn't know who Philip Glass was. I didn't. And so finally, I moved it uh, back to Texas, where I'm, that's where I was born. I went to work at the steel mill there, and then didn't talk to nobody, and the family that knew about it didn't want to talk about it anyway, because they didn't believe, so, uh, Philip Pyle... And it had to be painful that they didn't believe you, especially the family. Oh, I've been called a liar my whole life. Um, Philip Glass, well, back then they didn't have cell phones, we had home phones, and he even called me and told me that, uh, I gave you this money and say it was a hoax. Well, now people are saying that I made all this up. You know, Philip Glass didn't help you this money. That's bullshit. Um, it's even written in a book. Uh, some guy wrote a book about fire in the sky. I don't, I don't know the author's name or nothing. I have never read none of his book. Um, but he even mentioned Philip Glass, um, offering me money. And Mike Rogers used to sit back in, in the 70s, if I took this money, it even kick my ass. So, <laughs> I, 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 I wasn't worried about it. Well, anyway, uh, uh, people are saying, well, this shouldn't happen. Well, people, if you're going to accuse me of doing something, you say it's 
say it didn't happen to you, you investigate it first. He goes, there's a cop named Bill, but there's a cop named Jim Click. He's the one who came to the door, you know. I, uh, go ask him, you know. Uh, look at the book that that guy wrote that uh, talks about it. Another version of Fire in the Sky, I guess. I don't know. But it's mentioned in there, and this is when Philip Glass was alive. So if it was alive, Philip Glass would have said something, you know. You would think and, so. Yeah, you know he would have. He, oh, yeah, He's outspoken. He, he wouldn't have hesitated to speak out. Yeah, because he hated Travis. He didn't like Travis at all, you know. And and it, it, it's what makes me mad. I mean, call the liar so many times, so many things, and I, I'm just tired of it. I'm just tired of it. Like I said, I was supposed to do a conference with Travis this weekend. But I don't know if I'm going to go. Um, I am going to go to the one in Nevada, I'm pretty sure, because uh, I'm going to do it by myself, and I'm going to tell the whole story. I'm going to tell everything. Um, there, there's even more that I ain't going to say on the video because I want to say it in the conference. Well, you know, to me it doesn't matter who believes you because what matters is that you know it happened. And, you know, nobody can change that. But, you know, the reason why I know you're telling the truth is because, number one, anybody that has had this happen to them, the event is real, then they're not happy about it. They're not doing it to get fame or celebrity. They do it to uh, create public awareness that these things are out there and they exist. And you have never tried to hog limelight from anybody. You have always been blunt and to the point and told the truth about it. And I can tell it really irks you that there's these other versions that are out there. And I really applaud you for having the integrity to come out and say what really happened. Because I think that's important. Well, I, I came out from the closet, I think, um, uh, you know, people, you, they're, this is true, it really happened. You know, I cannot tell you that Travis part really happened, because I wasn't there. But I can right. tell you that what I saw really happened. You know, um, I came out, I, that's because I don't want a book. I don't want people to think, well, you're selling a book, you're trying to make money off it. I didn't do this to make money. I did a conference last week, and, and and I didn't make no money off of it. I didn't make a dime. He paid for the motel room. That was it. He paid for me a, a shuttle to get there. You know? If I'm going to go, they have to at least pay the motel room and have me to get there. You know? Yeah, it's not have. a thing you get rich at, because, you know, I do radio, and I don't get paid for it. I do it because I want the truth out there. And it's just, to me, another point that shows me just the type of man that you are. Well, I, I work for a living. I drive trucks, so I, I make pretty good money. So I don't. I'm just tired of it. I, I, I just I'm gonna do this one conference and and just walk away from it. I don't I don't need it in my life. John Collette's not gonna do no more either. We're both done with it. He won't. Well, even do it it's really old to, to you now. I'm sure you're tired of just going over the same old stuff all the time. Well, we're. It, it, no, actually, we're trying to get, we're trying to, we're tired of getting screwed. And every time we do something for buddy, uh, we get screwed out of it and they make the money. Uh, I mean, you passed the polygraph test. Yeah, I passed several. Um, I passed the first one and, um, I was the first one that took it. I passed it. Uh, I, I passed it. You know, and people say, well, the reason you passed it is because Travis wasn't really dead. You know, we didn't know that. And if you look at the fourth question, that's another thing. I ha I put the uh, polygraph test on Facebook a couple years ago. Now, if you look it up on the internet, it's in Travis's name. Oh, I just how, my how did that happen? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Travis never even seen this until we did a, a, a conference together and I showed him my copy. And now it's in Travis. Travis told me the other night, well, I didn't have nothing to do with that. Yeah, I bet you didn't. But anyway, that's the reason I don't post nothing on uh, on my wall no more that I don't want out there. You know? Well, I can certainly understand how frustrated you must be at this, but, you know, it's really sad that 
in the UFO community, there is such a area of ownership. People think they own all the truth, that all that matters is what they say, and that they really are not supportive of other people. This is not what the UFO community is supposed to be about. This really divides That's not true. I, I'm not crazy about MUFON. I mean, jokes about MUFON. Who are you going to call? Not MUFON. Um, they treat people like, you know, I've talked to so many people, and they say, well, MUFON doesn't treat us right, you know. And there's other people out there that, you know, this is not what this is about, man. We should help each other. You know, if, 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 you should believe the person until, until, you know, well, you got, there's a couple of people out there that's taken polygraph tests and flunked them. And they're still doing something. You know? Wow. I, 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 I don't know about that one, you know. Uh, to me, yeah, that's you really that, far. Well, you, you, you can't pass a polygraph test. There's something up there. <laughs> well, you're exactly you're exactly right, and no offense, but when I see the same old people at a conference that's been for like uh, the past twenty years, then I don't go to it because we're over all that stuff. We know all the details of Roswell and all these other things. It's time for some new stories to come out. Yeah, but a lot of people don't. Uh, I've I've got a ex-wife, her one of her family members. He's got some awesome pictures of UFOs out on his land. But he doesn't want to show nobody because he doesn't want to happen what happened to me happened to him. You know oh, you I see. see. I see. So he doesn't, he doesn't come public with it. A lot of people are that way. They don't want to come public because, because they, they look, hey, look what happens to you. It's going to happen to us. And I didn't reach. You know, I didn't come out. I was forced to come out. The cops come us out. You know, uh, it sometimes feels like you're in a clown parade, doesn't it, Steve? <laughs> you're in a freak show, and you're yeah. the freak. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, I know where you're coming from. I I grew up in Mayberry, and when when I came out in my town, they came and interviewed me the first day. Like, what? What are you doing? Interested in UFOs? They were like in shock, you know, but. I don't care. They think Southern women are crazy anyhow. I don't care what they think about me. Well, I've got, I got a couple of books that don't believe. Um, and they're pretty smart. And, um, um, they, they said, well, you know, how come they don't come out for the smart ones? How come they just come out to the uh, dumb truck drivers, you know? <laughs> 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 I don't believe, um, this was an act. Uh, I believe they knew we were there. They knew, you know, uh, because they're too smart for that. You know, you see this video of this alien, YouTube, alien walking to his ship. You know that's not real. You right. Know? Why? Because he's, he, they would have known that he's there. I agree with you. I think they, they knew. I think they, they were waiting. They, they, they would have uh, made him forget everything that he knew. You know, they would have took the camera, uh, you know, they would have made the film that wouldn't work, you know. They would have done something. I mean, that's, exactly. way, that's way too close for them not knowing they, he, that person was there. Exactly. You know? So, uh, I, I, I mean, they knew enough that they saw a, a, a truck and knew, and when he came out, that, you know, he was a, a specimen because they wouldn't have taken him otherwise, you know. He didn't ask to be taken. Travis? Right. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't believe this was an accident. I believe they knew we were coming. They knew we were there. They were waiting for us. Um, they wanted Travis. I, 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 they probably wanted us all. I don't know. Um, this, this was no accident. If they want you to see them, you'll see them. If they don't exactly. want you to see them, you're not going to see them. And if you see them, there's a reason why you see them. I'm glad that you mentioned this because when I was speaking to you earlier, one of the things that I noticed when you were telling me a little bit of stuff is that the fact that you saw different things, uh, different details, you know, than trap. And I found out that uh, the Rendlesham Forest incident, um, the two officers, security officers that saw the craft, they both have different stories. But the reason I believe is exactly what you said, Steve. They let you see what you want to see. And... They are capable, yes, your mind control. 
I believe Travis was lying. They made you know, it. Yeah. So, you know, I believe, I believe the governor can do it. Mind they you. can. Yep, you're right. Yeah. I can't prove it, but I, I think they probably can. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I've interviewed many people who have testified to just that. And if you look under uh, the CIA and look up their covert operations and psychological uh, warfare uh, experiments, you'll see that they delve a lot into mind control and psychic abilities. Well, I need to ask you, since since all of this happened, have you ever felt that you were an abductee? Have you ever noticed any markings on your body or had strange dreams? Strange dreams? Yeah, unusual dreams about UFOs or... Uh, or uh, everything I've ever seen, I was awake. <laughs> oh, you didn't have the you didn't have the pleasure of being knocked out. <laughs> no. Well, you said something to me, and I have to ask you about this. When you came uh, on Messenger to ask me about being on the show, one of the things that I told you, I said I always believed you, uh, which you know was true. And you told me you said you knew that I did because uh, the grace had told you that I would believe you and to do the show with me. Can you explain a little bit about that? Because I was no. really <laughs> run away by that. No, I ain't going there. I, I, I not going to. No. <laughs> okay. I, I, uh, I, they, they, I was told to have this interview. Um, well, I'm glad. I'm glad. Because uh, your story is true. I don't know much about your story, but I was told it was true, so that's why I'm doing this interview. Well... It, you know, there's an old saying, it takes one to know one. It actually, there's a lot of truth to that. And in the spirit of all the things that have happened to me, I'm more than honored to share your story out there. And, and I feel like there's so much more to you than people have even realized. And that the incident that happened in 1975 was only the tip of the iceberg. Yep. And I have to ask you, what do you think, you know, this is just hypothetical, but what do you think ETs are trying to tell humanity? What are, they, what are they trying to do? Right. What do you think they're trying to do? I don't know. Collecting parts? Do you think they're friendly? No. Oh, no. no. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I've seen movie Paul. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I was at a friend in the house. I don't, I don't watch UFO movies. I don't watch Star Wars, Star Trek. I don't watch that stuff. And I was at a friend's house. He said, you want to watch a comedy? And he puts Paul in there, and I laugh my ass off. I had to watch that thing three times. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I guess you got sick of it by then. Um, I, I kind of like that movie there. If you listen to it, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> well, you know, that's what import, is important, because I've watched some things, and they just really resonate with me. Well, they're, they're out there. I don't know what the first so, thing I, I try not to talk to you. And I, 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 I can see um, shadow people. I shadow people. Um, me and a girlfriend, uh, I was living in Maine. We were, we were laying in bed and, and uh, uh, sitting there talking. And one came through the it came It came through the wall. It went across this and it went out the window. Well, usually when I see them... I'm the only one that sees them. Well, she turns around and looks at me, and she said, "Is that one of your friends?" <laughs> and I looked. Oh at her. God! I said, "I looked at her, and I said, you saw that?'" And she goes, "Yeah." And, and it was the first time she ever saw one. You know? Wow, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, Gosh. I, I, I've slept with other people. They're quite terrified. Did you feel like there was evil in there, or did you have any kind of emotion? Well, I'm used to seeing them now. They don't bother. I'm not scared of anything anymore. I used to be, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sleep in the woods and by myself. So I, I finally did it. I, I went out in the middle of nowhere, you know, it was something I had to do with my, to myself, you know, to the door. I went out and spent the weekend all in the woods by myself. And then, uh, I took my daughter. To the site where Travis got zapped, and we spent the night there, and she wouldn't get out of the truck. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's, she's like 12 years old. 
I'm not getting out of his truck, man. <laughs> he believes you, that's for sure. <laughs> wow. I, you know, you read my mind, because I was going to ask you if you'd ever went back to the site before. I, I've been back, uh, David Zinnett, uh, my daughter, and, uh, and once when, uh, right after it happened. I've been back like three times. Wow. Well, I tell you what, I know this is not what you planned on when you came into this world, is having to be a witness for a strange uh, UFO uh, sighting, but like I say, we don't pick this, it picks us. And your story is important because it's entirely based on the truth as you experienced it, and it's important to get out there. I think that some people lose, and I'm not saying this uh, specifically against Travis Walton or anybody, but just in general, they lose part of their integrity when they fall into the UFO circuit, when they start doing things and just to please the media and to make money and to, to get a story out just for publicity. And it's the real people who still suffer from the experience with PTSD and uh, who get threats from people and harassment. That's where the real story lies. What what do you want people to know about this that you haven't already said that you feel like it's important? They're out there. That it's true. It's really happening. Are well, yes, I'm here. I I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. Anyone in your family, like uh, your parents or siblings or your children, have they ever saw a UFO or or think they were an abductee? We're not going to go there. Okay, that's fair. Well, I really appreciate you getting in contact with me. And hey, if I got a referral from the little gray men, that's all right with me. <laughs> that's okay. I I appreciate I appreciate uh, being one to spread the truth. <laughs> I'll tell you some things once we're off the air. <laughs> okay. Well, Steve, if somebody wants to contact you, do you do you want them to get in touch with you? Do you have an email, or or should they find you on Facebook, or do you want contact? Um, I have people sending me messages asking what to do. So what do I do? <laughs> Don't call me. <move> on. <laughs> well, you gave the best advice. Even the people in Tucson are resigning because they're saying it's a bunch of baloney. It's infiltrated with disinformation. So, you're all right in my book, Steve Pierce. <laughs> well, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> you can come back on my show anytime. It would be a pleasure to have you. And um, I want to thank all my listeners for tuning in to a different side of what happened in the 1975 incident in uh, Snowflake, Arizona. And the best in your life and in your future um, endeavors, Steve. Hey, thank you for having me. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Notes from the Underground with your host, Deborah Jane East. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook.